Good evening. Tonight we're going to speak about Thanksgiving in Jewish law and lore. And what does Kabbalah and Hasidus say about it? The idea of gratitude to show appreciation and the ugliness of ingratitude of not being thankful goes back in the earliest literature and uh, record of history that is in, uh, in Jewish uh, tradition. From the beginning of creation, the Torah tells us about Adam and Chava. And right from the beginning, we read in uh, the Sefer Bereshis that they sinned because Chava gave the forbidden fruit to Adam. And after Adam ate from the forbidden fruit, Hashem speaks to Adam and He says to Adam, you know, Ayecha, what, what's, what's happening? How, why did you eat the forbidden fruit? Hashem had commanded Adam not to eat from the forbidden fruit. And Adam ate from the forbidden fruit. So Hashem, so Adam answers, Ha'isha sha'ata nasati madi hi nasnali. The woman that you gave me, or the woman who you gifted me, she gave it to me. Blaming on the woman for his own failure. Hashem actually commanded him not to eat from the forbidden fruit. So what is he saying that the woman who told me, the Gemara says, Rav, let me shame him. If, if the master tells you to do something, and the, someone inferior to that tells you to go against your master, who are you going to listen to? You listen to the boss. What kind of an answer did Adam have? He says, well, the woman gave it to me, so I ate it. But the biggest problem is what the Gemara says that really Adam at that time was kafui toiva. He, was, he had ingratitude in him. He was ungrateful. Because Hashem gave him a gift. He was all alone. He was lonely. And Hashem said, it's not good for a man to be alone. So I'm going to make a helpmate for him. Eze Kinecte. So really, the woman was a gift to him. So what is he saying to Hashem? The woman that you gave me, as if the fault is because Hashem gave him this woman. And the woman that you gave me, that's the one who told me. So it's as if he's trying to say, you know, Hashem, you gave me this woman, and because of her, I messed up. So in other words, instead of appreciating the gift that Hashem gave him, he gave him Chava, which he should have shown total appreciation to Hashem, so something goes wrong, he blames it on that. That's totally ungrateful. And the Gemara over there, in Avayi Dezara, continues and says that this is the way Moshe addressed the Jewish people, the Eden, in the desert, when they were complaining about the man, and they called the man Lechem Akloikel. Here's the man falling from heaven, they could feel every type of taste in it. And they said it's a light a, a kal, it's the way Rashi says, kal, kloikel is kal. It's, it's a lightweight food. Now it literally was a lightweight food because when you ate the man, since it's a food that came totally from heaven, you didn't, they ha you didn't have to go to the bathroom because there was nothing there that wasn't absorbed in the body. When we eat food, so what's healthy is absorbed in the body and what's not is, is expelled from the body. But the man which is a heavenly food that were given to the Jewish people in the desert, they didn't have to. So really they should have been very comfortable with that, that they don't have any bodily needs 
as a result of eating. But they complained about the blessing that Hashem gave them. And Moshe Rabbeinu said to them, Kafuye toiva b'nei kafuye toiva. You're an ungrateful people, the children of, of, of ungrateful. Because there the deaths were complaining and, and for a gift that Hashem gave them. And they're the descendants of Adam who was ungrateful to, for a gift that Hashem gave him. So we have to analyze this. And the issue of gratitude and ingratitude is a fundamental issue in Yiddishkeit and in Menschlichkeit. It's our Yiddishkeit, our Judaism, and our humanity. Because someone who's ungrateful is not a good Jew and he's not a good mensch. And it's a reflection of deep psychological flaws. And it's also a reflection of a lack of proper sense of relationship with Hashem. The first thing a person does in the morning, he wakes up in the morning before he even washes his hands. A Hasidim don't even walk. They don't take any steps before they wash their hands in the morning. Negelvasser. They have right next to their bed, they have a, a, a pail and a cup with which they wash, wash their hands. They, won't, they don't want to take any steps before they wash their hands. But before he, but, but before he even wash their hands, by the bed, in bed still, as soon as you open your eyes, you say, I thank you, Hashem, that you gave me back my life. That's the first thing you do. You say, you don't say even the word Hashem. You say you. I thankfully and grateful to you. With mercy and, 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 and with great faith, faithfulness. So that's how we start our day. That's how a Jew starts a day. And the Hasidists, they emphasize this point that this it comes from something so deep in a person's, in the neshama of a yid, that if the first thing he does, even before he's allowed to make a bracha, before he is out of bed, he still has the impurity of night on, upon him. And to get out of the impurity of the night and have a sleep, he has to wash his hands in the morning and rinse his mouth in the morning. And only then he could stop making brachas. You can't make brachas without washing your hands in the morning. So when you still have that state of impurity that comes upon us when we're asleep, when we're sleeping, nevertheless at that time we still can talk to Hashem. Not in a prayer calling Hashem's name, because we're not pure, we're tummy. So how is it possible to connect in Hashem even at a time when you're still impure? That's because there's a certain essence in the Yiddish and the Shama, which we're soon going to talk about and elaborate about, that is connected with Hashem even in a person's impurity. So that's a shine of something that's very high and deep and, and from, a, from the holiest of holies of sources. So that's what Chassidus emphasizes about this Moida'ani. Now next Monday night is Yutas Kislev, which is the Rosh Hashanah for Chassidus. And we're going to have over here a Fabrengin uh, next Monday night. And because it's Yutas Kislev. Now in 1965, in Yutas Kislev, by the Fabrengen, the Rebbe sat many hours, but he gave an address that later became uh, um, a, a, a masterpiece and a fundamental 
concept of Hasidus, a fundamental discourse of Hasidus, was developed from the talk that he gave in Yutas Kislev, Tavshin Chavav, was 1965. Over there he spoke about this prayer of Moida'ani. It, it is the most um, essential form of thanksgiving to Hashem. As soon as you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes. In any state where a Jewish person is, even when he's tame, the first thing he says is, thank you Hashem. So the Rebbe spoke about Moida'ani how it could be understood, this concept, in all four levels of studying Torah. There are different levels of studying Torah. There's halacha, there's ethical teachings, there's mystical teachings. And generally, in our literature, they speak about pshat, remez, drush, soid, which is the, 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 the simple meaning. Then there's the halachic meaning in drush, there's remez, there's medrash, indirect messages that come from it, ethical messages. There's the Kabbalistic message. And after the four, he spoke about Hasidus, the Hasidic understanding of Moedani. And he goes at length in that. We're not here to speak about that. That later on, uh, it became Kuntris in Yona Shalteris Hasidus which is, has been translated into English, if you really want, and I certainly recommend it. And I remember when, when this came out, I spent days studying it, because it's such a deep um, presentation of this, of, of what does it mean, Moida'ani, and really what Hasidus, what is the essence and the point of Hasidus. So I studied it with all the footnotes that were written on the page. And it was really an in-depth study that touched areas of halacha and areas of Kabbalah and areas of drush. And it was, uh, I remember, very, very uh, moving time. I spent like two weeks every day studying it for many hours, this text. But over here, we want to touch on a few points to appreciate what does it mean, thanksgiving, in Jewish the Jewish understanding, and especially how it has been illuminated with the teachings of Hasidus and Kabbalah. What does Moida'ani mean in Pshat, in the basic fundamental? You're thanking Hashem. So you wake, wake up, and you're alive, and you have awareness. So this consciousness that you have now enables you later to speak and to move and to do what you're going to do all day. <coughs> so the first point of life awareness that you have in the morning is saying, thank you Hashem for giving me back my life, for giving me back my Hashem. So this is already the foundation for the rest of the day. You're starting the day with gratitude. You're starting the day with thanksgiving. From the first moment you opened your eyes. Simple. What is it? Hashem gives you back your life. You recognize your life comes from Hashem. So therefore you're thanking Hashem. It's pshat. And then the Rebbe goes into the other interpretations that has, has to do with law, the law of receiving something. You're giving your neshama to Hashem. Hashem is holding it for you. And He's giving it back to you. What happens if you are guilty? What happens if, if you give someone uh, uh, to something to hold for you and then you owe him, suddenly you, you, your car crashes into his house. Does he have to give it back to you or he doesn't have to give it back to you? It becomes a whole discussion in Jewish law. If I give you a, a, a Rolex, a fancy, fancy Rolex, right? And I say, watch my Rolex. And then by the next uh, hour, I crash into your car, your uh, Bentley. We're only dealing with big stuff around here. So I crash into your Bentley, and you are worried and concerned that you're not, I'm not, I'm not going to pay you. So you say, I'm holding back the watch from you. 
So in halachi, you're not allowed to hold back. When I give you something and deposit, you have to return it. And you can't hold it back because of some other claims you have against me. And that's one of the things we learned from the Maida'ani. It's also included in the lesson of Maida'ani because I give my neshama to Hashem, He's holding it for me. We say it in the Barikrishma Shalamit, I'm giving it on deposit, my neshama to Hashem. But then up there, they can look at my account, I'm pretty, and I may be back, I may be in debt in my account. So maybe He should hold back Chasushal, my neshama. Or not give it back to me completely with my whole consciousness. So nevertheless, the Torah uh, uh, gives it back to us. So there's a halachic discussion over here. But the, the point which, which, the, which the Rebbe makes over there, on, the, on this talk, the Rebbe makes the point how according to Hasidus, when you look at the, Hasi, the, the what Hasidus gave us and taught us then it sheds a whole new light on what thanksgiving is and in the most absolute form he explains that these four levels of understanding Torah correspond to the four levels of the Nishama which, which Kabbalah talks about Nefesh Ruach Nishama and then there's Chai Yechida, which is emphasized more in Chasidus. Yechida is the highest level of the, of the soul, of the Nishan. Chaya, and then higher than Chaya is Yechida. There's Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, then there's Chaya, and then higher than Chaya is Yechida. So the Rebbe says that those four levels of Torah study, Pshat, Remesh, Drush, Soit, correspond to the four levels of the Neshama. The highest level of the Neshama is Yechida. Yechid is connected with Mashiach because it's the highest experience in existence which we're going to experience when Mashiach comes. And in the Neshama, it's the highest point of the Neshama. In Kabbalah, in Eitz Chaim, it says, what's Yechida? Yechida is Nitzot Echad Boi Renas Elivra. These are the words of the Eitz Chaim, of the Arizal, Reb Chaim Vital. Which means, that there's a spark of Hashem that becomes the neshama. It's godliness. It's a, like it says in Tanya, mamish. So that essence of us, that essence, that is the yechida, that is what Hasidus comes to, 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 to reveal in Torah, the yechida of Torah, and in us, as Kalal Yisrael and each individual. What's the Yechid that's in us? That is our essence. And it's also our, our connection to Hashem that is so intense that we are, we become, we become one with Hashem. And we are empowered with godly powers. It is from the Yechid that the Jewish people are here forever. It's from the Yechidet, no matter what, how a person is and what state he is, he can do tshuva. Because just like Hashem is not limited, that part of him that he could, he could reveal, which is, the, which is the, the, his essence, which is a spark of Hashem that's in him, so that Hashem is Ein Saf, is not limited, so he is not limited. So therefore, even if he finds himself in the lowest spiritual cesspool from which he feels that he is chained and he can't get out of that so if he can tune into his yechida then that never can be contaminated it can never be polluted and through that he can do tshuva and he can find the power to do tshuva and overcome any limitation any obstacle now since this comes from yechida let us look at the state of mind and the attitude of Yechid. The attitude of Yechid is that looks at the world the way Hashem looks at the world. The way Hashem looks at the world is that this world didn't have to be. And even when the world is here, it's only because there is godly energy making it here for every second. And it's as if the world is forced to be here. 
It doesn't belong here. Because there's no space. Before creation there was no space. There was no time. Now imagine if there is no space. Can I make something in a place where there's no space? If I want to put a, bo a, bo a balloon in water. It's not going to stay in the water. I have to have my hand keeping it in the water. Why? Because the water has no room for a balloon. Because the balloon is, is empty of water. And on the water, there's no room for something that's empty of water. So the, so the water is going to push it up. So I want the balloon to be on the water. I have to keep it there. So the force of my hand will keep it there. If there is no space... If we can imagine something that there's no empty space, then how is something going to exist in a, in where there is no space? So the Greeks never had a concept of no space. The Greek concept was that if you take away the universe, we're going to have one big empty, black, empty space. And even scientists were thinking in that direction until in the 20th century they came up with ideas that Space ends. This is the idea of black holes, which is another discussion that the scientists are trying to figure out how, what's on the other side of the black holes where there is not supposed to be space or empty space over there. So what is there and so on. But the point over here is that in Jewish belief, the Raman writes that before creation there wasn't even empty space. So that darkness that we imagine in our eyes, when if we put away there's no world, that empty darkness itself was created. Before Hashem created the empty darkness, there was no emptiness, there wasn't empty space either. So Hashem created it. So the whole world doesn't have to be here. So the whole world is, exists because there's a godly energy making that to exist. And forcing the world to be here is because there's an energy keeping it here. So therefore every atom and every molecule and every object that's here, it's because there's a godly force keeping it here. And if for a second that godly force is removed, there's nothing. It's like it never existed. And the, that's how Hashem sees the world. Because He sees it from up there, how there was nothing and He made it. See, I don't see the world that way. I wake up in the morning, I see a world. We who are in the world, we don't see it. So we take it for granted. I wake, of course I'm here. I take it for granted. Now I know there's people who die. And I know that there must have been something before me because I see babies born. But the sense of the person is, I feel that I'm here. I don't feel or sense my nothingness before me and what it's going to be like after me. Because a person, the body only senses and is aware of its presence, of the now. But the neshama already the intellect thinks and makes calculations. So I know that, well, right now I'm here, but maybe later I'm not going to be here. The way the Yechida looks at our existence is that even now we're only here because of God's mercy, because Hashem is giving us vitality, holding us there, keeping us up there, and for, for a second, Chaz V'Shalom, for Hashem release the godly energy, it would all disintegrate. It would turn into nothingness of before creation. So now, when we say, thank you, Hashem, in the morning, it's not just, th thank you, you're giving me, there's me, and you gave me back my life, so there's me and I am thanking you. The way Hasidus looks at it, there is no you here, there's nothing here. There's no you, no your mother, not your father, no world, no nothing. Your total existence and existence of the whole universe is totally dependent on Hashem. And the Yechida of our Neshama is aware of the totality of how the totality of our existence what, what Chesidus and Chakira call Yesh Me'ayin. How it's something from total nothingness. I am a something from total nothingness. The whole world is a something from total nothingness. And it's not that it has to be here. It doesn't have to be here. So therefore, the thankfulness is a totally different thankfulness. 
When I wake up in the morning, the ani, the way it's according to Chassidus, is I don't have to be here. And I'm and I'm here only totally, but totally by your mercy and by your blessing and your graciousness. Rab Mechemla. It's totally because of your graciousness that I'm here. When we thank somebody, we thank somebody for something. So I thank uh, my parents, they gave birth to me, they took care of me, they paid for my education. But there's me, and there's other parts to me, there's things that I had myself. I grew up myself, I studied myself. It's not a total gratitude. It's a gratitude. If I'm an appreciative person, it's a gratitude for what that person gave me. But nobody gave me my whole totality. But Hashem, if you look at it according to the Echida of the Nefesh, my whole totality is from Hashem. Not only does Hashem give me back my Neshama in the morning, but my body doesn't even have to exist either. It's not only I think, uh, you say, that I gave you, you gave me back my neshama. But what's my neshama? The neshama is the life force that I inhale and exhale, that, that I, I sense. But also, we say in David, the whole creation is redone every morning and every second. And that's why Hashem made it that every morning there's a new sunrise. Why did Hashem make that there should be constant renewal? There's renewal of days, there's renewal of seasons, there's renewal of the, of the, of the moon every, every month. He made that because we should wear that Hashem is running the world. There always has to be renewal. And Hasidus teaches us that the op, the, there really is an absolute total a renewal every second when Hashem is keeping the existence there. So if we look at the Moidaani of a Yid, according to Chasidus, that is coming from a place where we recognize Hashem's total, how the whole existence is nothing else really besides Hashem, is the only real existence. And the whole world, and, and myself included, are just expression of that. So what kind of a gratitude is there? And therefore I can never, one of the things about this is, what you, we can never complain. People complaining. So a person has uh, one hand, chaz So he's complaining. Why is he complaining? Because why should I only have one hand? I should have two hands. Why other people have two hands? Why should I have only one hand? It's not fair. But if a person recognizes that he has nothing, and his friend has nothing, so Hashem gave him life, and He gave him one hand. It's not, does he have a right to complain? Why do I only have one hand? He's jealous of another person. If his attitude is that really I am nothing, and it's just Hashem's grace that gave me life, so whatever He gave me is already a gift. So if you have one hand, you have a gift from Hashem, one hand. So now you want two hands. Who said you have to have two hands? Who said you have to? Let's say Hashem would have made only people with one hand, so He wouldn't complain. According to Chassid, there's no room for complaining at all. There's no room for ingratitude. What do you mean you're not grateful? Because you have a, you have a tough. So yes, Hashem teaches us this prayer, and that and there's punishment, and and there's hope, and we have to hope, and we have to pray, and we have to help other people, and we have to have, be grateful to other people. All that is true. But gratitude, if we look at the Hasidic view of it, gratitude is recognizing that everything is from Hashem. And that I have nothing in the total, and I am an I, and my world is total by itself. 
I in my world are total and absolute nothingness. So if there is a one-celled animal, oh, that's a, Hashem's grace. And it becomes a two-celled animal, and it becomes animals, and it becomes humans, and it becomes human with one hand, and now a human with two hands. So it's total gratitude. It has to be total gratitude. Because our whole existence is absolutely dependent on Hashem. That's also always about honoring father and mother. Why is honoring father and mother one of the Ten Commandments? And if you'll see, it was on the tablets, was split five and five. And the one that was in the second uh, set, on the second luach of the Lucha Sabris, has commandments between man and man. Not to kill, not to commit adultery, not to covet another person's house or his wife. It talks about <coughs> mitzvahs between man and man. And on the, on the first of the tablets, it's between man and God. And on that list of the five mitzvahs that are supposed to be between man and God, it has also honoring father and mother. Why? And this, the, the Ramban and other of the Rishayim asked this question. Why? Why did you put honoring father and mother? It would seem that honoring father, father and mother are connected more with mitzvahs between man and man. They were kind to you. They took care of you. So you should appreciate it and show gratitude and thanksgiving to father and mother. Why did Hashem put it together with the mitzvahs of believing in God, not to have idols, to keep the Shabbos, and, to, uh, and not to swear falsely in God's name? And He puts over there also honoring Father and Mother. Because really, the honor of Father and Mother has two sides. One is to offer thanksgiving to a, two human beings who sacrificed for you to show appreciation to them. <laughs> And to reciprocate by taking care of them and they need you. That is gratitude. That's thanksgiving in halacha and in Torah. But also if you show gratitude to your father and mother who gave you life in this world with the help of Hashem, then you'll show gratitude to Hashem who is your big father and mother, so to say. Is the big, the big, the big one. Because he's, he's also a partner in our creation. It's father and mother. And the Gemara says there's a third partner. That's Hashem. So therefore, someone who shows ingratitude to parents who gave him life in the physical realm, then certainly he's going to show ingratitude to Hashem who gave him the totality of life. So therefore, all of these things go together. Today is Yud Dalat Kisif, it's, it's the 90th anniversary of the Rebbe's wedding. So Chassidim all over the world today are for bringing and made, you know, we'll say L'chaim later soon. The way the Rebbe took care of his mother, it was incredible. He was already Rebbe and he would tear himself away from the office, an office which he was in contact with the whole world and he would go for an hour to visit his mother. Because yeah, that's the way he honored his mother. And when his mother was a shul, he would walk her home. There were so many people, attendants, they could have to go to go home, he could be busy with the Hasidim. But that's the way the Rebbe honored his mother. Gratitude. And people who did a favor for him, he was forever grateful. The Rebbe left Russia in 1929 with his father-in-law, but they wouldn't let his father leave Russia. His father was the Rebbe of what's now Yekaterinoslav, what's now it's, uh, the Nepa Petrovsk, it was then Yekaterinoslav. And they wouldn't let the, the, his father leave. So the Rebbe was already engaged to the daughter of the previous Rebbe, so he left with her. They were hoping that they would get papers for him to come to the wedding. They didn't let the, his father come to the wedding. And later, they, later they arrested his father. They sent him into exile, and he suffered a lot. He was sick, and he died. And anybody who he knew that, that knew came to New York. That the Rebbe knew that he was helped his father. The Rebbe was forever grateful to those people. He was forever grateful to them. So, 
the Jewish way, certainly the Hasidic way of gratitude is to recognize and to appreciate favor that's done to you. Where do you see the utmost and absolute gratitude? It's to Hashem because our, the totality of our coming into existence is coming from Hashem. And that's the Moida'ani. Moida'ani lefanecha, that is the foundation of the day. And Hasidus puts a, 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 a total depth and understanding in this in a totally different way. What is ingratitude? Ingratitude is idol worship. Ingratitude is idol worship. Those people who worship the sun, they worship the ancient, let's go to the ancient times. They worship the sun. Why do they worship the sun? Because the sun gives light. They were farmers, they needed sunlight. They worshiped rain. They needed rain. They worshiped the winds. Sailors worshiped the winds because they needed the winds to bring them from one uh, city to the other city. So they, they worship these, these, they worship nature, right? Now, what's wrong with worshiping the sun? And the sun, he needs sunlight, he needs rain. What's wrong worshiping? So he worships, so he would say to the rain, rain, please rain for me. He thought that the rain has some powers of its own, that there's some energy of rain, there's a rain god. There's a rain god. And there's a, a, a sun god, and there's a this god. The, the, the statues that they made were symbols of spiritual gods that they thought exist up there. So what's wrong with it? But the, but the sun does give light. We should appreciate the sun, no? We should appreciate the rain, no? So what's wrong if they... They, uh, every morning, they said, rain, thank you so much, I appreciate the rain, and now I'm going to light a candle. You have these going, still, they don't buy, they light candles uh, to this saint and that saint, and for the third saint, there's a saint. Now, today they have, they, they, some of these Catholics in South America especially, there's a saint for rain, there's a saint for fidelity, there's a saint for sun, there's a saint for the Mishagas. They light a candle for this saint, for that saint, same thing, it's the same idol worship. What's wrong? You should have shown appreciation to the rain, no? So the, the way uh, the, the, in, our, in, Jewish, in Jewish philosophy says, the rain and the sun is like an axe in the hands of a wood chopper. So if I want a house, so I go to a wood chopper, uh, who is also a carpenter, I say, here's the forest. Chop down some trees, and make me a log cabin, right? So, or the guy who has a chisel, a chiseler, and he cuts stone, and he makes me a stone house. So now, after the, the person used this ax to chop down trees and to cut the wood and to make me a nice log cabin, I say to him, I say, wow, this is such a beautiful log cabin. And the man is standing so proudly by the lock cabin that he made with his axe. He's holding his axe and he's standing there. So I look at the axe and I say, wow, this is such a good axe. And I kiss the axe. I need a picture of the axe. And I t tell him, how do you call the axe? Give me the axe. I'm going to worship the axe because the axe made my house. Right? So it's an insult to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the woodsman, right? He made the house, not the axe. Hashem makes sun to give life on this planet. But Hashem made the axe, just like the woodsman, he made the axe, and then he uses the axe to chop down the trees, and he uses the axe to chop the trees into logs to make the log cabin, and that's why you have a log cabin. But it's the utmost of being ingratitude to honor the axe instead of the woodsman. So the same thing, that's what idol worshippers. The idol worshippers, they worshipped 
the, the natural forces which gave them the blessing and they ignored the fact that this was all in the hands of Hashem. The ha rain is in the hands of Hashem. The fertility is in the hands of Hashem. The, the sun is in the hands of Hashem. These are all tools that Hashem has. And frankly, nothing changed. But today, people don't worship the sun and the rain. They worship scientists. They worship ideas. They worship ideologies. They're worshiping different Mishagasan, that they think that these things are going to bring them success. So they start worshipping this computer, they're going to make money from this computer. They will start worshipping money because the money is going to give them blessing. But they don't understand that the money is also a tool in the ends of Hashem and the person can have a lot of money. And then in one second Hashem can make a Shalom sick and he won't be able to spend the money. It's all tools in the hands of Hashem. So if he shows ingratitude to Hashem, that's idol worship. Idol worship means ingratitude to Hashem. And if you're in gratitude to Hashem, then, then, me, then you're in gratitude, then you're, you have ingratitude to everybody and to everything. It's a sign of selfishness. You think you are powerful. That's why the, 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 the Chumash, it says that Hashem warned the people, Hashem warned them that when it comes to in Chumash, Pashas Ekev, where it says, "Vochal to v'savoy to v'rachtas Hashem alakecha alatayarz atayish Hashem aslach," that Hashem is going to give you a land that flows with milk and honey, is blessed with the finest of fruits, and bounty, and you'll eat, and you'll be full, and you'll and you should bless Hashem. And from there we learn the mitzvah of benching after we eat. And then Hashem says, as Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking, "He shama lacha ben tishkechas Hashem alakecha." Your, your belly is full. Be careful. You shouldn't forget Hashem. Why? Because penteichel v'savaita. You're going to eat and be full. Ovatem taivim tivne v'yeshafti. You're going to build big houses and you're going to reside there. Uv karcha v'tsarcha yibim v'chesav zarb yibulcha. You're going to have a lot of cattle. You're going to have a lot of gold and silver. And everything you have v'cha shalcha yibah v'ram levavecha. And your heart is going to become big. And you're going to forget Hashem who took care of you, who took you out of the desert and took you out of the Egypt and He took you in the desert and He cared for you. But you're going to say to yourself, All this wealth, all this power, it's my strength that did this. That is the ultimate of ingratitude. The absolute form of ingratitude is selfishness and self-centeredness. When he says, I made myself. That's the total opposite of moida'ani lafanecha. That I, 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 I recognize that everything comes from Hashem. So that, that recognition that everything comes from Hashem is the real thanksgiving. Especially the Hasidic look of it, that, uh, that everything is from nothing. And the totality of our existence comes from Hashem. And the total opposite of person feels, the totality of my existence is me. His self-centeredness. So if he's, in, therefore, if he's self-centered, a narcissist who loves himself, so, and there's different levels in this form of ingratitude. It all comes because of his ego. So if he's so into himself and he loves himself to the degree, he's never going to be thankful to anybody. Because he's only th he doesn't see past himself. So the more he sees into himself, that this is the biggest form of idol worship. He worships himself. He senses himself. Like Moshe Rabbeinu said, the Jews are going to say, who are wealthy and fat and successful, uh, we, we are the greatest. We can do everything ourselves. This is, this is the problem. And therefore everything is going to fall in, 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 in its place. And even without the religious factor, 
Psychologists speak about gratitude and ingratitude. People who are grateful and thankful are happier people in life. They live longer. You can look up studies upon studies upon studies. People who thank others live longer, are happier. The psychologists don't necessarily make the connection over there. Why is it? But there are statistics. Statistics are facts. They studied people already from 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And they gave tests to students. And 30, 40 years later, they see how their life turned out. And there were markers in those tests, questions that they asked these students to check if they're happy, if they're positive, if they're grateful. And gratitude and appreciation for the gifts of life that they received showed that these are the ones who 30, 40, 50 years are alive and are healthier are better and better relationships and so on. So now th th the psychology behind it is because if I am grateful I'll thank my spouse I'll appreciate my children I'll be sensitive to other people's pain and I'll be happy why would I be happy? Because I appreciate life's gifts so that's even a secular appreciation. But now let's take this in the light of Torah and Yiddishkeit, and especially of Hasidus. If I know that I am nothing, and I am here only by the grace of God, so I will never be disappointed. And even if I am factually disappointed, I will recognize that yes, Maybe I am now going through difficult times. But listen, I'm not owed anything. And whatever I have is extra, is a blessing. So I should be grateful. So Tari teaches us, you wake up in the morning, you're, you're conscious, and you can say moidani, say moidani. That's already a, a positive attitude. So if Tari teaches us not only religious beliefs to recognize Hashem, but healthy beliefs that no one owes us anything and everything comes from Hashem. And therefore I'm happy with whatever I have. And if I have more, I'm even happier. And if, and if I win the lottery in life, I understand this is Hashem who wanted me to win the lottery. And if I have houses full of, of wealth and gold and silver, like he says over here, I will not say that it was my strength and my talent that made me so successful. Because I'll recognize it from Hashem. That is gratitude. And that brings me more friends. So the gratitude that I have to Hashem, which is the absolute gratitude, because the, if we're talking, when we're talking to Hashem, it's about absolutes. This is going to help me in my relationship with my spouse, with my children, with my family, with my friends, with my neighbors, with the world around me. Because it's already embedded in me that I'm not, a, a, my life is not about myself and therefore not self centered. What's the right thing to do? I will ask myself. What are my responsibilities? And finally, the uh, Alter Reb in a, in, cha, in, a, in a later chapter in Tanya, from what we're learning in our Tanya class, chapter 45, he speaks about developing love for Hashem. How do I have love for Hashem? So he explains a verse that King Solomon said, Kamayim upon him, upon him came leva adam ala adam that the heart of man towards his fellow, so my heart towards your heart, is like a face that's reflected in water. So they used to look in the water, you'd see your face as a reflection. Today you look in a mirror. What kind of face, 
What are you? Are you smiling to the mirror? The mirror is going to smile at you. Are you frowning to the mirror? After the negovasa, you, you didn't say moidani and you're in a bad mood because you didn't start the day the right way. So what are you doing? You're frowning. If you would have said moidani and then watch negovasa, you go to the mirror, you'd smile. So you have to know like this. If you smile towards somebody, King Solomon said, Shlomo Middleton, said, if you smile to someone, the person will smile to you. If you have positive energy toward the other person, that person, his heart is going to feel it. And they'll have positive energy towards you. So in life, when you relate to people, smile, be positive, and show love. And therefore, they're going to smile and be positive and show love to you. So that says in Tanya, that also is our relationship with Hashem. If we will think for a moment how Hashem loves us. And he speaks over there about Jewish history. So the Jewish people were slaves in the cesspool of humanity, oppressed. And not only physically oppressed, but also spiritually in the dumps. We were in the cesspool of humanity spiritually. So imagine a king who goes in the road and he sees this person is rolling in the mud, some slave. And the king says, looks at him and says, you know, I see some something special in that person. And he says, come into the coach. And he takes him to the palace. And he washes him off, puts him on clean clothing, feeds him the finest foods. And he says, you know something? You're going to be my prime minister. You're going to represent me. I want you to be my right-hand man. So from the cesspool, he becomes the right-hand man. That guy, if he's a half a mensch, is going to love the king. So we, a person should think every moment, Hashem took us out of Egypt. And he brought us, chose us to be the chosen people. And he took us in to make us, we are his people. And I would add what he says in Tanya about our own blessings. Think about the blessings you have in your life. Hashem loves you. Think about every day Hashem loves you. So Shlaya Melech says, if you have a heart and someone shows you love and showers you with the gifts of life, if you're half a mensch and you have a heart, you should reciprocate. But you have to focus on it. We have to focus. We don't focus on the blessings of life that we have. And that's what Thanksgiving is about. And this is why I'm moidim, we bow. What's the bowing when we say moidim? Moidim is thank you, Hashem. It's a blessing in the davening when you thank Hashem. So you don't only say thank you. We bow. What's the bow? I recognize that everything is from you. So we're bowing that Hashem is over us and our whole blessing is over us. And even when the chazan blows, we don't say, oh, the chazan is bowing for us. Because you also have to bow. When the chazan bows, you can say amen to what he says. That's enough for the blessings that he says. But when the chazan bows, it's not enough. The chazan's bowing for me. That the chazan says the blessings for me, yes, he can say the blessings for me. But he can't bow for me. Because, because like I say to people, you have, to, you have to say thank you to your mother and father. Don't send someone else to say thank you to your mother and father. There's some things you have to do yourself. You have to bow yourself by the moedim. And this is what it's all about. If your person is a good Jew, he's a good mensch in the biggest way. And that's what Thanksgiving is all about. Have a good night. Sure.